Good morning. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. We welcome you to our worship. Wherever you are on your journey of life and faith, we affirm you and we welcome you here. Especially if you are a visitor or new to the community, we invite you to find the black pad and take it and put down your information and share it with your neighbors so that we can know that you were here and get to know you. Um, one worship note, you will see four hymns on the hymn board and there will be a hymn after our silent prayer of confession. It's the Amen. You know it already. Yeah. As soon as you hear the music, you'll know it. But we'll join together in our conclusion of our silent time with Amen. It's a fellowship time downstairs after worship. We invite you to linger and have some refreshments together. We had a very successful midnight run on Friday night into Saturday morning. And um, I think you might be able to see the pictures from Midnight Run on the website, maybe even Facebook. And you may ask, wh why are we only seeing pictures of the participants? Well, because there's a rule for Midnight Run that we protect the integrity and dignity of the people that we serve, and we're not allowed to take pictures of those that we serve. So you'll only see our mugs and for what it's worth. But we are very grateful for your help and your assistance and your contributions for Midnight Run. And you'll see in the bulletin an exploratory meeting will take place the first Sunday in March to see if we can assemble a mostly adult team for Midnight Run. There are a lot of folks who are interested and curious and like to do a run. And our youth group student run is pretty well established and full, so we think we might have enough to do a second run. So if you're curious, you'd like to come. No obligation, but it'll be after worship on March 3rd, and that information is in the bulletin. Our invitational youth choir rehearsals continue, and we will meet again this Wednesday at 4 p.m. You do not need to be affiliated with this church. You just need to be interested in singing and sharing your voice, and in first through eighth grade. So please bring along whoever would like to be there, and that rehearsal is 4 o'clock on Wednesday. There will be a meeting of the congregation on Sunday, February 24th, immediately following worship for the purpose of receiving annual reports and conducting such other business as may appropriately come before a meeting of the congregation. All members are invited to attend. You also see in your bulletin an announcement regarding Bill and Nancy Kansas' upcoming trip to Cuba, joining with the East Hampton Presbyterian Church. Like last year, they will be bringing along supplies and materials that we take for granted but which are very much in need in Cuba. So if you are able to contribute this, that, or the other thing, there's a suitcase in the narthex, and we thank you in advance for anything you can uh, provide. We give thanks that God has called us to this place this morning. You have contributed to a community this morning that is not like last week and will not be like next week. And so we invite you to be mindful of those around you and mindful of our place this morning as a part of the body of Christ. So let us take a few moments to be at peace, to call upon the Spirit. Maybe be mindful even of our breath and our time together and prepare ourselves, mind, body, and spirit for our worship of the Lord.
Good morning. Good morning. I thought I'd start with a poem by Mary Oliver. Why I wake early. Hello, sun in, the fa in my face. Hello, you who make the morning and spread it over the fields and into the faces of the tulips and the nodding morning glories and into the windows of even the miserable and the crotchety. Best preacher that ever was, dear star, that just happens to be where you are in the universe to keep us from ever darkness, to ease us with warm touching, to hold us in the great hands of light. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Watch now how I start the day in happiness, in kindness. Please rise if you are able and join me in the call to worship. <clears throat> God has called us to this place for renewal, restoration, recreation by the Spirit. God has called us to this place for community, for the covenant, for communion by the Spirit. Let us worship God. God has shown us what is good. What does the Lord require of us but that we do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. In penitence and faith, let us join together in our corporate prayer of confession. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that when we were far away from you, you came to us. We thank you that even in our unfaithfulness, you are ever faithful to us. Time and again, when we rebel, you return to us, resume the conversation, and continue to believe in us, even when we disbelieve you again and again. For your promise to love us and see us through, for your continually renewed promises to us, we give you thanks. In Christ we pray, amen. We're invited into a time of personal prayers of confession in silence.
Remember that in the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, we are assured that there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive. There is no hurt so terrible that God cannot heal. It is God who accepts, God forgives, God sets free. Friends, receive the forgiving love of God in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. join with me in the peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. May, May the, the peace, peace of God, God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please greet those about you sharing signs of peace and reconciliation. <laughs> do this all day, I think. <laughs> the Old Testament lesson this morning is from Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe, robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, here am I, send me. 
the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Amen. Now I get to invite the children and young people, whomsoever you may be, to come join me here for the children's time. everybody. Oh. Here we go. All right. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Look what I made this morning. A heart. A heart. You know why I made it? What's coming up? Valentine's Day. That's right, Valentine's Day. You probably could make a better heart than I can, but it's still a heart. I'm glad you recognized it because I thought it might look like a kind of like a funny strawberry or something, but it's a heart. And Valentine's Day is coming up, and it's the day when we give our friends and our family members cards, and we make them heart things, and, and we tell them that we love them, or that we like them very much, and you probably do things in school, too, where you exchange Valentines and things. Yeah. And it made me think of a new book that we're going to have in the church library. It's called I'll always love you. I'm not going to read it now, but you can read it later if you'd like to. And this is about a boy who has a dog named Elfie. And every day the boy takes care of the dog. The dog is not his brother or sisters or anybody else in the family. The dog is his. So he feeds Elfie and he takes Elfie out and he takes care of Elfie. And every day at the end of the day especially, but every day the boy always tells Elfie I'll always love you. And they grow up together, and they do things together, and they share together. And of course, dogs don't live as long as human beings, but every day, the boy told Elfie, I'll always love you. And then the day came when Elfie's life came to an end, and Elfie was no longer living, and the boy held Elfie and said, again, I'll always love you. And he knew, even though Elfie was gone, that he had told Elfie every day, not just on Valentine's Day, but every day, I'll always love you. And that's what we do here in the church, is we remember that God told us the same thing in Jesus. Jesus was God's way of telling us, I will always love you every single day. And every single day, we have an opportunity with our friends, with the people we haven't met yet, maybe even the people that we might not like very much, but especially the people we love, we have opportunities to do the same thing, to try to find ways to say, I'll always love you, by doing something, or saying something, or writing something, or giving something. There's all kinds of ways that we can say, I love you, every day, not just Valentine's Day. So this is a really good book to read. It's great for beginning readers. I'm going to put it in the library after worship, okay? Thank you for coming up. What do we do now? Right. That's right. Okay. Put your hands together. And close your eyes. Take a nice deep breath. And then let it out. Thank you, God, that you will always love us. Thank you that you give us chances and opportunities and ways for us to always love one another every single day. And we thank you that we have love because you love us in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for being here. If you're dealing with children or grandchildren and death and dying, this is a very good resource to deal with that topic. And we have a few other books in our library that also do that from a, a developmentally appropriate perspective for children and youth.
Our lectionary readings in the New Testament continue with the Gospel of Luke today, and we read this morning from chapter 5, Calling of the First Disciples. We read verses 1 through 11. We are invited to open ourselves to God's Word in Scripture. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the Word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake, The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For Peter and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So this moment with Simon Peter and the others was just as literal as it was metaphorical. The call from Jesus to Simon Peter to put out into the deep water and let down your nets was a very practical and concrete request asking Peter to unroll the carefully stored nets and set a course for a possibly uncharted and unknown depth. So it was very concrete and measurable and practical. It was also a symbol in and of itself because he was asking Peter, and by extension, all of us, to accept an invitation, an invitation to go deeper. This is not something that is easy in our society, in our culture. We're not often afforded the time and the space or the ability to go deeper. Our economy and our culture celebrates speed and superficiality. It's difficult sometimes to stop and pause and take in what is immediately before us at any given time and to reflect on a deeper level some of the more weighty questions that are before us. It's not easy. And I saw the latest example of this in a Canada Dry ginger ale commercial. Maybe you've seen it too. It opens with a yogi person on a mountaintop taking a very thoughtful pose. You look, it looks as though you're about to be given some wisdom. And he opens his mouth and says something about nirvana. And then he pauses. And then he reaches off the camera and pulls out a can of ginger ale. That's it. That's it. That's your pathway to nirvana. A sugary carbonated drink. I think there's a whole series of them with this yogi looking person. And then there's the funny story, you've probably heard me tell it before, about the family who whenever they roast a ham would cut off both ends and put it in the oven. And at one family gathering, when this routine was going on, a new in-law noticed someone doing this family tradition of cutting off both ends of the ham before putting it in the roasting pan, putting it in the oven. And she asked, why do you do that? And uh, the mother-in-law said, because we've always done it this way. And to that, the grandmother, the matriarch, perked up and realized what the line of questioning was. And she said, no, there's a reason why. When your father and I were going through the depression, we didn't have many kitchen utensils or roasting pans. The one we had was very small. So the rare time we got a ham, 
I had to cut off both ends so it would fit in the roasting pan. You watched me do it, so you thought that's what you do with a ham every time. Now you have all of this roasting pans. You don't need to cut the two ends of the ham off anymore. It's a funny example of somebody stopping and questioning why things were the way they were. But it really spells truth about all of our lives. We spend so much time and are taught to be so frenetic in our lives, it's very difficult to stop and think and hear Jesus' invitation to go deeper. It can take work and courage. And Simon Peter's resistance was real. They'd already packed up the nets. Some of you know what commercial fishing is like. They'd already packed up the equipment for the day. And besides, Simon Peter says, we didn't catch anything. But he agrees. More work, more time. And in the moment, no assurances, no guarantees of what was going to happen. Most of our lives are spent between the work and the result. Most of what we do, especially the deeper things, are spent going moment for moment, hour to hour, day to day, not really certain about the results. Young adults are taught to work toward a retirement that they cannot yet see, no guarantee that they will make it that far. Young children and students are taught to work hard in school, stack up the grades and stack up a good resume in order to be successful. But do they know really what the future will hold? We all live our lives in this space between the work and the result. Education, in fact, is a good example. Teachers have a student for how long? 180 days out of the year to mold and to influence toward this goal. But they rarely get to see the empirical evidence of the results of their work. Did they produce a good citizen? Did they create a person capable of critical thinking? Did their work help a form, form a well-rounded, mature, thriving adult? So often, we don't know. Even with our own children, those of us that have children, our time is spent between the work and the result. I was very moved, as many of you might have been, when we had Bill Bogardus's funeral here weeks ago, and somebody in the back stood up, a former student, and shared how he had helped her through a very difficult time. That's a moment that a teacher treasures. My mother, who taught uh, special ed for 34 years, once in a while in town would be approached by an, an older person who said, do you remember me? And she would remember them, and they would tell her how much she helped them. And it would bring her to tears. But we rarely get those moments. And as Christians, this is a useful metaphor. We are rarely promised a clear result to our work. When Jesus asks Simon Peter to put out into the deep water, he's simply asking Simon Peter to do what he knows how to do. That's all we're asked, to do what we know how to do. Peter was a fisherman. He knows how to fish. He knew the sea. He knew the life of the sea. It's the work that he grew up doing. And so this time, the result is not up to him. It was up to Christ. And what a catch. But that's where we live our lives. We're not asked to do things that we don't know how to do. We're simply asked to do what we know we can do and leave the results to God. That's a difficult task as well. Penny read the call of Isaiah in chapter 6. He doesn't know what he's getting into. He doesn't have a contract that he signs. He doesn't have an exit clause. He's just asked to go. And faithfully, without knowledge or anything that might come, he goes. He just goes. It's a marvelous example. And we live, as you know, we all know, in a time when there is no sector of society that you can encounter that is not going through magnificent tectonic shift and change. Brian McLaren wrote a book, The Great Migration, How the World's Largest Religion is Seeking a Better Way to Be Christian. And in the book, he says that the Protestant church, our church in the USA, is shrinking and wrinkling. Shrinking and wrinkling. And it's true. Worse than that, it's also closing. I was speaking this morning with someone about 
Sweet Hollow Presbyterian Church in Melville on the 110 corridor. Wonderful church with a wonderful heritage, a wonderful history. Another one of our congregations that is on the edge and is uncertain about its future as a mainline Protestant denominational congregation. As we have lived it in our time in history, there are really three perspectives that we know about. We are living in the momentum of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, a period of construction, if you will, when what was constructed were most of the major institutions, the modern democracies, the modern economies that we now draw benefit from. And now we acknowledge, as we look around at every sector of society, a time of deconstruction, a time when much of what was built in the last 500 years is going through a major transformation, if not breakdown. And the question before all of us, especially in the church, for our, for our context, is are we on the verge of what's called a new renaissance, a time of creative reconstruction? We've learned just in the church alone that you cannot simply keep doing what you always did and expect it to succeed the way it once succeeded. We've learned that over and over again. We have to enter into every situation with an open mind and an open heart and an open spirit to be true to what's worked before, but to be true to the present context, which requires a more imaginative approach. We have all awakened to this reality that we need to reevaluate. Basically, it's Jesus' words echoing, put out into the deeper water. Don't worry about the results, but go where you've never been. Who would have thought a generation, no, let's just say 50 years, who would have thought in this sanctuary, if you went backward 50 years, that we would need a projector and a screen? Who would have thought 50 years ago there would be a need in this community for a Maureen's Haven? Who would have thought 50 years ago that driving down Oaklawn Avenue, you would look at the sign out in front of the high school and see on one side Spanish and on the other English? Who would have thought? Who would have thought 50 years ago that the wealth of the world's knowledge, once the purview and possession of a massive library, say in Alexandria or at the Vatican, is now accessible to each one of us with a small monolithic device that fits in our pocket? Who would have thought? Major changes that require us to rely on Christ and to go deeper. So a few weeks ago, we got a little participatory and you accepted my invitation to turn and talk with your neighbor about a question. I'd like to invite you to get participatory again. We'll have another turn and talk this time. Share a time in your life Maybe it was 10 years ago, maybe it's right now. When you were called, like Simon Peter, to go deeper, where was that? What was it? How did you respond? Maybe you know someone right now who is encountering a time like that in their lives and they've become an inspiration for you. They've been called to go deeper. What did that look like? What did they do? So you might have to move around a little bit. Um, some of you may not. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself if you don't know who's behind you or next to you. But uh, take a few minutes and share a time when, oh, you guys already know each other. Share a time when you were called to go deeper and what's that like. Okay, I'll leave you to it.
give yourselves 30 seconds to wrap up. 30 second warning. Thank you for obliging that moment. And I hope that the Spirit provided. As we go out this week, let us be mindful to where Christ is calling us to paddle out, to ask the hard questions, do the hard work, or keep doing the hard work, and to trust Him for the results. The prayer we will pray in a moment is a prayer from the Corimila community in Ireland. Let us join together in prayer. God of Hagar, when Hagar was exiled in the desert, she met you and gave you a name, the living one who sees me. We have walked far and seen many things. And now, because of what we have seen, because of where we are going, because of where we are, we give this new name now. We do not destroy past names because they have brought us here. We celebrate the new name that will bring us on because you are known by many names, names which bring us on. Amen. Amen.
please remain standing and join with me in the affirmation of faith printed in your bulletin. May God bless us with discomfort. At easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that we may live deep within the heart. May God bless us with anger. At injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, hunger, and more, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world, so that we can do what others claim cannot be done, to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Freely you have received. Oh, sorry. It's all good. I knew it. We always hope something will happen that's not in the bulletin. There it is. Let us join together in prayer. We are counted as your people, and we are grateful to be called by you and glad for the gift and the freedom of the gospel and your way of faith in the world, that you have marked us and named us and signed us, and we are different, different memories, different hopes, different fears, different ways of being, that difference we find glorious, but at times a burden. We yearn to be like others, like the others, the others in their power, the others in their money, the others in their freedom, the others in their certitude, in their security, like the others, uncalled, unburdened. We come to you in that deep trial of difference and likeness. And so, O oh God, engage us in our difference. For you have called us. Give us courage for our different vocations in the world. Energy for our different hopes in the world. That what we do out there would make a difference for those we call the others. That we might see them as your children. Be with us, O Lord, this day and tomorrow. In the name of your crucified Easter one, so unlike all the others, we pray in the name of the prayer that he told us to remember. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temp and lead us not and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. <laughs> freely you have received, freely give. Let us present our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. We give you our money, cold and hard, or crisp and easily blown away. We ask your blessing, O God, on these gifts that they may be transformed by their use, no longer cold, but the warm smile of friendship, the warmth of a power bill paid or a jersey knitted, no longer hard, but the loving acceptance of a wise counselor and the kindness of a helping hand, no longer crisp, but the tears of happiness on the face of a child and the mellowness of good food and company shared, no longer easily blown away, but lasting, unchanging, always there like your love for all your creation. Amen. Amen. simple gesture of solidarity in Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind to you and gracious. May the Lord lift up the light of his face to shine and smile upon you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.